Hello everyone, welcome to The Net Online. Thank you guys so much for joining us. We're gonna kick things off as we always do with a short video clip that will correspond with our message today. Be sure to like and subscribe so we can give you future alerts for when we post messages and drop a comment below and thank you guys so much for joining us. Okay God, you want me to talk to you? What should I do? Give me a signal. I need your guidance, Lord. Please send me a sign. Ah, oh, what's this Joker doing now? Okay. All right. I'll try it your way. All right, Lord. I need a miracle. I'm desperate. I need your help, Lord. Please, reach into my life. Uh, what the... Are you? I got you. Today we're, uh, we're on our next part of our series, The Names of God. This is our fourth part, Debar Yahweh. Probably not one of the names you've heard much or if ever, but this is a really, really powerful name that we're going to look at today. Uh, let's pray. Father, we just thank you for your word. We pray that you would speak to us in your word this morning that Lord, you would reveal to us your, your nature and character, that you would show us uh, from the Scripture your ways. Lord, may we know your ways, not just your acts. Come, Holy Spirit, Spirit of truth. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so the names of God, life-changing insights into God's character. Uh, this... Uh, I love the quote from Dale Tackett from the Truth Project. May we gaze upon the face of God. So as we delve into the scripture, as we delve into the names of God, may we, may we see, may we gaze upon the face of God. Um, this can change us. The scripture says that we're transformed by the renewing of our minds. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. And so we want to have our minds renewed. And as we are receptive and the Spirit is working in our hearts, He changes us, changes our perspective, changes our heart. So as you all that have been a part of this series already know, we look at the Old Testament, we look at the Hebrew name in the Old Testament. We're pretty much going in a chronology as they're revealed. And so far, many of these names, compound names of God, the Old Testament are revealed, many of them in the book of Genesis. And they unfold as the narrative unfolds in the book of Genesis. There'll be a new aspect of God's nature and character revealed as the narrative unfolds. So it's a progressive revelation as God, as we read through the scripture. So then we will look at how that name is reflected in the New Testament, how it's fulfilled in Christ. And so we will look at that as in the conclusion of each message, we'll always look at where it reflects in Christ. So Dabar, Dabar, I'm not even sure how you would say it, but this Dabar Yahweh it's, a very, uh, it's, a, it's one of those names that occurs many times in the Bible, 242 times. However, most books you ever read on the names of God never include this name. It's really kind of remarkable. 
And there's several names that we're going to go through that are not in the typical kind of, you know, I've read numerous books on the names of God, and they may have seven or eight names. We're going through 18 names, and this is like our sixth one, I think. So, but we have to understand, this one has been hidden to many people, but it is legit. It is an absolute insight, divine insight in God's nature and character, and so, Debar, Yahweh, it means the word of the Lord, or the word of Yahweh. It's a compound name of God. It's a divine expression, much overlooked. If you think of the name Deborah, for instance, in the Old Testament, the word Deborah is a derivative of the verb, or the noun, Deber, or Debar, okay? Debar is a verb, but nonetheless, Deborah is derived from this idea of the word, the word. Um, so... I'm going to start out early with a notable thought today. And so it says, <clears throat> in this context, this word debar is much more than just a word spoken. It is better described as a speech act. Its meaning would be more comparable to the word enactment. In a modern sense, an executive order or royal proclamation or royal decree. Uh, when God speaks, God acts very differently than we. We speak and we don't always act. How often people will say, well, I'll get to that next week or I'll do that tomorrow or I'll do this when or I'll, I'll be in church this Sunday and we don't come. Or, and we make these, these proclamations all the time that don't have action behind them. And so what we have to understand is God is not like that at all. When He speaks, He acts. And He is good for His Word. And so this word, 240 times, 42 times in the Old Testament, when you see the, the Ten Commandments referred to in the Bible, they're referred to as the Ten Words, the Ten Debar, in other words, or Deber, which would be the noun. The Ten Commandments, the Ten Words, these are proclamations, they're enactments, they're commands, you see. In the Greek, we call it the Decalogue. Right? Deca for tan, log for logos, or rooted in logos, or the, mean, the Greek word for word. We'll mention that a little bit later, but ten words. Logos in the New Testament is a very similar use to the word uh, debar in the Old Testament. It depends on the context, but generally they can be very similar. So let's start. The first place debar Yahweh shows up. And you might think, and I think the reason that this is not referred to as a name of God is because as we read our texts, we read our Bibles, it just sounds like it's saying, and the Lord's about to say something. But if you'll read this a little more closely, the first time Debar Yahweh shows up, you'll begin to see that this is not just an ordinary speech. So here we begin with, with Abram, who became Abraham. After these things, the word of the Lord. So I put in yellow the actual Hebrew rendering, okay? So after these things, the word of the Lord, the bar Yahweh, came to Abraham in a vision saying, Do not fear, Abraham, I, Abram, I am a shield to you. Your reward shall be very great. Sounds like a pretty good vision to me. I would like the Lord to be my shield, and I would like to know that my reward will be great, right? And Abram says, O Lord God, Adonai Yahweh, which is the first time that occurs in the Bible. We'll look at that soon. What will you give me since I am childless and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus? And Abram said, Since you have given no offspring to me, what one born in my house is my heir. He's saying, How does this work? How are you going to reward me when I don't even have you know, descendants, future descendants. Let's continue in Genesis chapter 15, verse 4 through 7. He says, Behold, then behold, the word of the Lord, there it is again, the bar Yahweh, came to him saying, This man will not be your heir, but one who will go forth from your own body. He shall be your heir. And he took him outside and said, Now look toward the heavens, and count the stars if you're able to count them. And he said to him, so shall your descendants be. Then he, 
Abram, believed in the Lord, Yahweh, and he reckoned it to him as righteousness. And he said to him, I am the Lord, or Yahweh, who brought you out of Ur of Chaldeans to give you this land to possess it. So stick with me here, but I want you to see a couple of things in this text that help us understand that this is not just ordinary speech that we're talking about. The word of the Lord, Dabar Yahweh, is a person. He came to him in a vision. It's a presence. Dabar Yahweh came to him in a, in, a, in a vision. The word of the Lord speaks. He took him outside. Who took him outside? If you follow the subject, the, the who took him outside is Dabar Yahweh. It took him outside and he says, Shall, I'll show you the stars and so forth. They ask him questions. You know, one day this will be like your descendants, uncountable. So I want you to see that. And then the other thing in the end of this text was he says, I am the Lord. At the very bottom, I am the Lord Yahweh. Who is he who's saying, I am the Lord Yahweh, Dabar Yahweh? You see, Dabar Yahweh is saying, I am Yahweh. I am him. I'm the one you serve. I'm the one you're following. I am your Lord. I was the one that was with you on this long journey. And, and what you're seeing in this is, again, an affirmation in the Old Testament of the triune nature of God. The Word, the Word of the Lord, the Word Yahweh and Yahweh are distinct, but they're the same. As Genesis 15 continues, Abram and Yahweh have a conversation. They make a covenant here. Yahweh lays out the promised land and foretells his descendants' oppression in Egypt. Also tells him about his death at a ripe old age that he will die in peace. So Debar Yahweh has a lot of things to tell Abraham, Abram. The first words ever recorded for Dabar Yahweh, which we just said, were, Do not fear. I am a shield to you. Your reward shall be great. The first words. I think we need to understand when he says, do not be afraid, this is a frequent comment throughout the Bible when angelic beings and so forth would, would appear to somebody. Often their first words were, don't be afraid. They would reassure them. Fear is the opposite of faith. In other words, as long as Abraham was afraid, it was not going to be really plausible for him to have real faith in the word of the Lord. God's reward to Abraham was limited until he could embrace faith. And that faith, once he embraced it, he believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. That's a great blessing. So the New Testament says we are blessed with Abraham as children of faith. We're the children of Abraham because we're a people of faith. And so we are rewarded with Abraham. Hebrews eleven six says, and it's almost to me alluding to this statement that Abraham, his faith was counted to him as righteousness. It says, without faith it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently who seek him. I love this scripture. I love the, the idea, the fundamental aspect of God's nature and character that he's a rewarder of those who live in faith and of those who are diligent in the way they seek after God. He rewards them. There's a blessing that rests on you. No matter how hard or difficult things go, there's, the fact is that the way you want to live your life and the way you want to walk it out is to live it in such a way that God will bless you and reward you as someone according to the promise. You know, there's been a lot in the air over the last two years. A lot of fear. A lot of fear has been, I think, cultivated I think by our own government, by our own culture, by the powers that be, by a lot of the, the mega tech industry, and for whatever reason, with their objective in mind, they know that if you want to manipulate a population, you can do it by making them all afraid and terrified, and they will yield their freedoms. They will do just about anything that you want them to do if you can get them in a maniacal fear.
It amazes me when I look out there, the amount of fear that's there. And even to this day, I mean, here we are two years out from the beginning of the alleged pandemic. So here we are ten years out, two years out. And I still see people walking outdoors with masks on, alone. I, I can't see any reason anybody would do that unless they're afraid. I'm kind of like, at this point, it's Omicron or something else. Just catch it and let's be done with it. It's like the mildest version. This is the time. Hug somebody. But stop being afraid. Fear is the greater enemy here. It's what Roosevelt said during the Great Depression. You know, fear itself is our enemy. They're facing the advent of World War II, and he's saying fear is our greatest enemy. I was sitting there, I was reading some stuff the other day, and I had to catch myself because I'm like, wait a minute. I was studying EMPs, <laughs> the electromagnetic pulse. And they could shoot a, detonate a missile above the United States at a real high height, a nuclear missile, and the thing goes off, and all of a sudden, 90% of our population will die over a six-month period. And I thought, that is really bad. And I started thinking, I need to buy food, I need to get something on my car so it'll keep running, you know, when none of the gas stations will be running, and we're just all going to die. And I thought, everybody's going to learn how to fish really fast, or garden, or one or the other. And so I started thinking about, I think, survival, and I, and I started getting afraid. I had a moment. Now, sometimes a healthy fear can come in, maybe you need to buy some food or whatever. But what I'm saying is that I do not want to be driven by fear, and I do not want to succumb to that spirit. I'm not given a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Much fear out there, but we as believers, we believe God, and we serve Him. And just like He said here, I am a shield to you. Your reward shall be very great. He didn't just say you'll be rewarded. He didn't just say your reward will be great. He said to Abram, your reward will be very great. Just say very great. I want to share in the blessing of Abraham. And the New Testament says that I can, be, I can be blessed with Abraham. I share in his blessing. How was Abraham blessed? The scripture specifically says how Abraham was blessed. How was he blessed? What does the scripture say? It says he was blessed in, you should know this, in every way. I kind of like that. I think I'd like to be blessed in every way. So fear is the opposite of faith. And so the first thing that Debar Yahweh says is do not be afraid. Do not fear. I'm a shield to you and your reward shall be great. I mean, sometimes we go through trials and we go through things and it's difficult or whatever, but the outcome of the Lord is good. Sometimes we have to just stick with things. You know, let your training kick in. It's called faith. <laughs> okay. The second thing about fear is it paralyzes. I had an uh, adventure yesterday with four of my grandkids. Three of them were fairly focused. The other one had a pacifier and a stroller. But one of the things I have a knack for doing is seeing snakes. And so there was one crossing the path up ahead. And so I went ahead of everybody. And I just picked it up and grabbed it. And I said, look at this. And they were all like, <gasps> it was a glass snake, which is kind of rare. It's, I have a special affection for glass snakes because my dad had one when I was about seven and I hawked it off to some kids in the neighborhood, and he was so mad. He had, a, he had a big tub with grass in it, and that glass snake was in there doing his thing in the grass. And I, one day I thought, he told me it was mine. He was giving me the glass snake, so I thought it was mine to be able to go barter in the neighborhood. So I took this snake and bartered it off. He was furious. So ever since, I've had a special affinity to glass snakes. They're really wonderful pets, if you will. So I had this glass snake. And I'm holding him, and he's wiggling, he's going crazy, and then he starts to calm down. And I say to the grandkids, I said, you want to hold it? 
fear kicks in. Are you sure you don't want to hold it? <laughs> and then after a while, we just kept working with it. And then one of them go. They're overcoming fear. I'm showing them. I'm showing them that it's safe. I'm demonstrating to them there's nothing to be worried about. The head's doing all this, but it's not biting. It's not going to bite. So it's a, it's a lizard without legs. And I, and I told them, I told them, you know, be careful with the tail. You don't want to break it off. It'll grow, grow back, but it's kind of weird. And it breaks off and it wiggles on the ground. And it looks like a whole new snake, you know, but it's just a tail. So anyway, so over time, finally one of them goes, <clears throat> Opa, they put their hands out like this. Put it in my hands. I want to hold it. So I took that snake and put it in their hands. And they held it. Like, oh. <sighs> okay, so it was that process of overcoming fear, but all of us will have things we're unfamiliar with or uncomfortable with. We'll have a moment of fear, and we, we all go through a process, but we do not want to be ruled by fear. Fear will paralyze you. When you should be productive, you should be taking risks, you should be moving forward, the fear will stop you. And so that's why Debar Yahweh is saying, do not be afraid. There's great things that he has in plan, planned out for Abram. And for him to fulfill those plans and that reward, he must not be afraid. God wants to assuage our fears with his word. Let him do it. So another example I want to give you, the boy Samuel, many years later, you see a reappearance of Dabar Yahweh. And I'm just going to read this story. It's beautiful. The Lord, the Lord Yahweh called yet again, Samuel. Samuel rose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he answered, I did not call my son, lie down again. Samuel did not yet know the Lord, Yahweh, nor had the word of the Lord, Dabar Yahweh, yet been revealed to him. So the Lord called Samuel again for the third time, and he rose, arose, and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli discerned that the Lord was calling the boy. Continuing, for Samuel 3, verse 8. And Eli said to Samuel, Go lie down, and it shall be if he calls you, that you shall say, Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place, and the Lord Yahweh came and stood and called as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. And the Lord Yahweh said to Samuel, Behold, I'm about to do a thing in Israel in which both ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. So there is, again, the word of the Lord came to him. It's personified. It's not just a, a speech. It's the word of the Lord came and visited with Samuel. And I, I, sometimes the Lord is coming to us, and he is speaking to us, but the voice is so familiar, you think you want to think, well, it's going to be something really dramatic, like, Dabar Yahweh came, you know, like this amazing thing and our, the ground's going to shake and we're like, but that's not necessarily at all the way God is speaking. So in this case, this voice, the Dabar Yahweh, just sounded like an ordinary conversational voice. It sounded like somebody familiar, it sounded like a family member, it sounded like Eli. And I can think of times when, when I was praying or trying to listen to the Lord and, and the leading or guidance would come in such an ordinary form that it was very disarming. So I was like, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Was that you, Lord? Were you trying to lead me? Were you trying to see? Another one that reflects a similar idea where Debar Yahweh appears is concerning Elijah the prophet. In 1 Kings 19, he came here, then he came here, remember he's running for his life from Jezebel, and he's hiding, and he's like, 
He got full of fear. Terror was in his heart. And he says, He came there to a cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, to bar Yahweh. And he said to him, Where you, what, <laughs> what are you doing here, Elijah? He said, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, Yahweh Elohim. For the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I alone am left, and they seek my life to take it away. Verse 11. So he said, who's he? See, is the bar Yahweh. He's having a conversation. The word of the Lord has come to him, and they're having a conversation. So he said, go forth and stand on the mountain before the Lord Yahweh. And behold, the Lord, Yahweh, was passing by, and a great and strong wind was rending the mountains and breaking in pieces the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. Verse 12, after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord, Yahweh, was not in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of gentle blowing. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face with his mantle, and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. And behold, a voice came to him. A voice came to him. Who's that? Debar Yahweh. The voice comes to him, as we just saw. And the voice says to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? <laughs> to me. He already asked him that question. But he didn't hear him. He just says, I've been zealous for the Lord. I've been doing this and that. And I've been running around and I'm taking care of things. And they're out to kill me and da, da, da. And I'm the only one left. Full of fear. He could not hear God. And But at the very beginning, Debar Yahweh tells him, What are you doing here, Elijah? And Elijah heard it, but he didn't hear it. And that's how subtle sometimes hearing the Lord can be. So the voice comes to him again and says, what are you doing here, Elijah? That's the real question, and that was the real answer that he needed to give, and he finally heard the voice of Dabar, Dabar Yahweh. Have you ever heard him speak? Have you ever had him speak that phrase to you? What are you doing here? I have. I remember when I first got saved, I didn't hear it maybe the way he did, but it was a gentle, subtle, but firm voice. It's not like I heard the words, but I heard the message. When I first got saved within the first year, I went to stay with my cousins up in Dallas, and they were crazy and wild. And I was a brand new Christian. I mean, probably just months old in the Lord. And all of a sudden, I find myself in a car with a bunch of kids they were driving all over Dallas, just absolutely nuts. They had alcohol, they had weed, they had everything in this car. And all of a sudden, I find myself in this car with these kids in a part of the city. I had no idea where I was, 16 years old, and the police are now chasing us. And now they're throwing weed out the, out the doors and the alcohol and everything they have. They're all underage. And so they're getting rid of everything they can. The police are probably following, seeing all this stuff flying out the window. They finally pulled over, and then they had them walking the line. It turns out one of the kids' dad knew the police, is, you know, and they, they kind of they had a connection. They got a free pass. But I didn't like it. And I felt like the bar Yahweh was speaking to me because here I was. They were out there walking the line, seeing if they were inebriated or not, and they were failing. I was the only one in the car not drinking because I was a believer. I was a brand new believer, but I had really gotten saved. My life was changed. My perspective was changed. My values had changed overnight. It was a very powerful time in my life, and but here I am thrust into this environment, and it's as though Debar Yahweh was telling me the same thing as Elijah, what are you doing here? And I made a vow from that day forward, never, never again would I allow myself to get in a situation like that. 
It will never happen. I remember one time I made a boss so furious. And I look at it now and I realize it's because that conviction was so strong in me. And I saw my boss drinking heavily and I could see they were inebriated, at least getting a strong buzz, right? And so she was ready to drive some of us home. And I told her, uh, you either give me the keys because I haven't been drinking and I will drive the car. She says, there's no way. She says, I, I can drive just fine. I'm not, there, I am not going to give you the keys and let you drive for me. And I said, well, then I'm going to get a taxi because I am not going to be a party to this. And she was so mad. She was ready to explode. Her head was going to explode. She was so upset. But I, I had that determination, not like I reflected to this moment, this is years later, but it's like it was in my heart. I will not allow myself in that situation ever again. And so if I'm going to be in that car, I'm in control and I'm the one driving. I will not let some drunk, I don't care if they're the boss, I don't care if they're the VP, I don't care if they're the owner of the company, none of that matters to me. I will fear God rather than man. That's how I've lived my life. But it was, the bar Yahweh came to me and essentially said, what are you doing here? I knew this was not me and I did not belong here. This was not, this was not where I should be. Elijah already had the word of the Lord. What are you doing here? But he, he didn't seem to hear it until he began to really listen. Sometimes we're seeking a word from God when he's already spoken. I didn't need to have a word from the Lord to know what to do concerning that boss. What I needed was conviction of what's right. So oftentimes I think, and, and, I, and I will say this with just a little bit of context, I believe in the prophetic word. I believe in praying with people and having, I'm hoping tonight we can pray with people and the prophetic word will flow some with us while we're ministering. That's, that's my hope. That's what I look for. But, I, but I'm going to put all of that in context and understand many times we're looking for a prophetic word when God has already spoken to us and he's already given us his word. And the fact is you have to, and people can be so driven by almost like an appetite, like I've got to have a word, I've got to be affirmed, I've got to hear the, the Lord speak. And sometimes a word can come and break, it can break a stronghold, it can break down that, that, an atmosphere or an oppression that somebody's living in or living under. I understand that. I believe in the anointing that breaks the yoke. But I also want you to understand that many of the answers that we're looking for, many of the things that we would like to have, God has already spoken in His Word. So we build our lives on the written word, the written word, what God has spoken to us through the ages and preserved to us and for us in the Bible is Debar Yahweh. The Lord has already come to us. The word of the Lord came to us in Jesus. Ultimately fulfilled. God communicates to us. He uses language and he's used the scriptures and he's been translated in so many languages. We've been addressing that in the church history and the whole process of that and how the scriptures as we know them for the common man were basically restricted from, from society for six, or six to eight hundred years. So there's so much ignorance among the people it's amazing anybody could even get saved. It was so dark. But the word, the written word, but the, the word of the Lord has come to us, has been given to us, and we have the scriptures. We have the word of the Lord. But yet sometimes we're not satisfied with the written word. But if you'll open it up and understand as you read it and learn it, and you, you open it up and you say, Lord, speak to me. You, this is a God-breathed, God-breathed text. Speak to me. You are behind all of it. You, you, your fingerprints are all over this book. Now speak to me. It's a living thing. Debar Yahweh. Imagine a marriage without words. I know sometimes it seems to me that I'll hear this occasionally that wives think we should know. Well, you should know I shouldn't have to say it. Well, 
Maybe, I, I think there's some men that are more proficient than I am. But I, I just, sometimes I just need to hear it. Sometimes more than once. Just like Elijah. Sometimes I need help. But the point of communication, words are so important. Communication is the bridge of relationship. So, you know, even, even little kids, like I think of my toddler grandchildren, and they don't know English yet, but they'll like, oh, they learn one word, no. <laughs> they can shake their head, here, you want to come over here? I think that meant no. And they can point, want that. They, they use a lot of sign language. They can cry, they can laugh, and they're communicating all the time. But it is their destiny to learn words. It's one of the profound, unique things about us as human beings is we need, and it's our destiny from the day we're born, we're striving to learn words. Who was it? Was it you, Reba, that put something up about, what were the two words you said um, Promise was saying and how she was saying it with a, uh, fweep and what was the other word? I need some fweep and I need some something else. But but her destiny, she's not going to always say I need some more fweep. You know, at some point she's going to actually learn to say sleep. And but they're learning language, and it's the most amazing thing that God has given us. When God has communicated to us much language, no. No tickle. I was very sad when I got that one. I'm like, yeah, but this is fun. No tickle. <laughs> it's one of my specialties. I like it when they go, more tickle. All right, so let's change gears a little bit. We're going to look at the New Testament. <clears throat> Yeshua, Yeshua. It's the Aramaic name of Jesus, which, by the way, is derived from a compound name of God, God of salvation. Joshua is Yeshua, or Yehoshua, which is the compound name of Jesus, is a nickname, like short of Yehoshua. Hebrews 11, uh, 1, 1 through 2 says, God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers in the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. So now what we see is that Dabar Yahweh is precisely exemplified in Jesus himself. Jesus is Dabar Yahweh. He is the Lord, word of the Lord has come. The word of the Lord logos, the word of the Lord has come to us. Every time Debar is translated in the Old Testament into Greek, that would be the Septuagint. So whenever the, the Septuagint translators would get to the word Debar in Hebrew, they would always translate it logos. Doesn't mean that it's a perfect equation, but it means that the translation moving to the New Testament, Jesus becomes the logos. Logos, you have to understand, it has a mysterious dimension to it, um, much more so than rhema, by the way. Rhema, the other word, they're used synonymously in the New Testament, rhema, logos, rhema, logos, back and forth. They, they, they mean exactly the same thing. However, logos has, when in certain usages, in certain contexts, it has a philosophical dimension. I'm about to lose you all, I can tell. The philosophical dimension of logos comes with the idea that Logos, Jesus referred to as the Logos, means that he is the connecting essence, the connecting principle of all reality. The essence of the meaning of the universe is bound up in the philosophical dimension of understanding Logos. And that's what John is talking about when he says, in John chapter 1, he says, in the beginning was the word Logos. 
And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Logos was God, the Logos was with God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him, and apart from Him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. And why didn't the darkness comprehend it? The Bible says, people a lot of times struggle, why didn't everybody receive Jesus? Why didn't everybody? It says it real clearly. When the light came into darkness, it says the darkness didn't comprehend it. Not like that inability. It says, that Jesus said it. He says it's because they loved darkness. It's not because they weren't elect. It's not because they weren't chosen. It's because they loved darkness. And at some point, if you come to Jesus and really get saved and repent and, and go through that process, at some point, you have to reject darkness. You have to come to a point where you're no longer saying, I'm going to live my life loving darkness. If you still love darkness, then you're not really His. Many people will claim, claim to be a Christian and they'll come to church, but they still love darkness. I'm not saying you don't struggle with darkness. I'm not saying you're not tempted by darkness. I'm not saying you don't maybe have a mishap or a lapse or something regarding darkness. But fundamentally, the believer hates darkness. That was a mouthful. Hopefully you got that. Jesus is the Word. He is Dabar. He is Dabar Yahweh. He is, he is God enacted. Jesus' words, when He speaks, they enact. Mark 11 on the next day when they had left Bethany with the disciples, Jesus, he says he became hungry, seeing at a distance a fig tree and leaf. He went to see if perhaps he would find anything on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. He said to it, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. In other words, the fig tree looked as though it should have figs. It looked as though it was ready to have figs. It was deceptive. The fig tree, and of course there's some symbolism he's alluding to Israel and so forth, but the fact is that his disciples, it says, were listening. Now later they come back, they pass by the fig tree. Later that day, they were passing by in the morning or the next day, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots up. Being reminded, Peter said, Rabbi, look! Like, like the rabbi's going to be surprised. Like, look what happened! The fig tree! The one you cursed, remember yesterday? It's withered. And Jesus said, he's saying to them, have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says is going to happen, it will be granted him. Therefore I say to you, all things for which you pray and ask, believe that you have received them and they shall or will be granted to you. I mean, what a powerful verse, principle of faith. But what I wanted you to see here is that Jesus, in the way that he, he is enacting his word. In other words, his word, he speaks to the fig tree, it withers from the root up. He can enact. When he says to the storm, be still, it calms down. He's in charge. He's in command. He is Debar Yahweh. His word enacts, and the scripture says that Jesus is the same one who created the universe. So in Genesis 1, when it says the Lord is speaking, it says, let there be light. That is Jesus enacting the act of creation from the very beginning. And so the Old Testament, the New Testament, there's continuity with all of this. So we understand who Jesus actually is, the one whom we serve. When we speak in Jesus' name and we're speaking according to his will, we can share in that enactment power. Doesn't mean you go around and say whatever you want and get it. What I'm saying is that according to Jesus, when he's doing this enactment, he's telling them that what I did, you could potentially do as well. You see, when he did that and demonstrated the withering of the tree, he didn't just say, yeah, aren't I cool? I could do that. Ha <laughs> ha. 
is be marvel at my power and my authority and how cool I am. It's not at all what he did. What he did is the opposite. He says, I'm going to tell you a principle behind what you just saw happen. And that principle is whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and cast in the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. And he goes on, he says, as far as the principle of prayer, he says, anyone, what, for whatsoever things you ask and pray, believe that you have received them and they shall be yours. So he's saying, you say certain things according to the will of God and the authority of God, and they can happen. And you can pray certain things, but he's saying the principle of faith, and so many people miss the simplicity about faith. They confuse hope and faith. So they'll say, well, I sure hope that happens. I remember praying for a guy once and I saw the Lord moving and I could see the symptoms disappearing. I see God's power coming and boom. And I said, I said, certainly, you know, I said, how do you feel? You have this, I feel better. I feel this. I, have this. I said, well, it looks, it looks to me like the Lord really touched you, like the Lord's healing you. You know what he said? The next words that came out of his mouth, ah! He goes, I hope so. See, that's not faith. Faith obtains a promise by an enduring position. And so when he says, all things which you ask and pray, believe that you have received them, that's present tense. So there's some things we're praying for and believing God for in according to his will, remember, and we're standing in that, and it may not manifest for a long time, but we're believing God. He says, ask and believe. He says, ask and believe. <coughs> All things to which you pray and ask, believe that you have received them. In other words, faith is believing it's as good as done, even though you don't see the results. Pretty simple. He says, and it shall be yours. Well, my response is to believe I have received and that God is acting in my behalf and it's, it's all coming about and he's working. But his, his part of the deal, his part of the equation here is that and it shall be yours. In other words, there still has to remain a trust, a, a steadfast trust that as I believe in God, I believe that I have received as though it were done already, even though I don't see it, and it shall be mine. Does that mean a month from now? Does it mean a week from now? Does it, but that's God's part of it. That's where we trust Him. and We remain firm and, and unmoved in that trust. I just gave you a little free lesson on faith and I'm trying to distinguish hope is so important because sometimes hope is all that people have. They're just hanging on by a thread. You know, is there a reason for living? Is, there, is God, you know? And so hope is so important, but you don't want to mistake hope and faith. They're not the same thing. Hope does not obtain the promises of God. Faith does. Hope does not bring about the righteousness of God as it did in Abraham. Faith did. So in Hebrews it says that the promises of God are obtained by what? Faith and, anybody want to go for that? The promises of God are obtained by faith and, did somebody say it? No, 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 no. If you said hope, you're not hearing me. <laughs> but anyway, I appreciate you sticking your neck out, you know, right now. Faith and patience. Did you just look it up? You didn't Google it? No cheating? But you're right. It's faith and patience. Faith and patience, meaning that you have the kind of faith that endures, the kind of faith that's unmovable, the kind of faith that really uh, understands that I believe God has heard me, I believe He's acting in my behalf, I believe that in time this is, this is working out, and I believe that God is, is alongside me and I have His favor and that this is going to happen. But sometimes things can take years. So, depends but you still believe, you trust God, and you take a posture, you take a position. But the enacting power of Jesus in his word, Dab, Dabar Yahweh, that enacting power, he has decided to share it with us. That's an amazing thing to me. There are times when we should not be praying, we should be saying Many people are saying things they should, they, they, I mean, praying things they should be saying. Do you pray more or do you say more? I probably say as much as I pray. Proclamations. Whoever says to this mountain, he's not talking about an actual mountain, ladies and gentlemen. He's talking about a principle. 
that there are mountains of obstacles in our lives. There are things which we're facing that, are insur- that seem insurmountable. But he's saying, but if you say to that mountain, be taken up and cast in the sea and do not doubt in your heart, it will be done for him. Hmm. That means sometimes we're dealing with an oppression, we're dealing with an attack of the enemy, and sometimes you can pray all day long, and it's not going to get rid of it until you put your foot down and say, in the name of Jesus, I take authority over this, I'm not going to live under this, it's not going to how I'm going to live the rest of my life. I've had, a, I've had a breathing issue for two years, and I don't ask the Lord all the time, heal me, please heal me, please heal me. Two years at the very beginning of COVID, and I would gasp for air, I was reaching for air, I would look at techniques and things, but one of the things that I pray often is, Lord, I just thank you I can breathe freely. Thank you for your healing power working in my body. Thank you that your spirit that lives within me quickens my mortal body to life. I'm doing pretty good this morning, but I'm gradually, gradually improving in the, in the sense that it shall be mine, but I believe in God that I'm not going to live with that problem that started with me two years ago the rest of my life. And it just makes sense to me. It's an attack because it's the way God uses me to speak and to communicate and to counsel and advise. And I can't be just gasping for breath all the time. Right? So I'm just, I'm, I'm being transparent with you, understanding that all of us have these obstacles and challenges. But we take a posture, we take a position of faith and you walk it out. And sometimes it's not immediate, and that's the problem. People are so shallow and so superficial about it. They think, well, I'm, I'm going to enact this. I remember a guy, we were in a, in a prayer chapel, and this guy was like, you know, there was a bee's nest up in the top of it, and he's over there talking to the bees and telling them, get out of here, get out of this chapel. And the bees are just, Zzzz. they were not moving at all. I mean, that's laughable, actually. I mean, it really was funny because he's like, ah, get out of here, bees, you know, and all this. And, and nature was not responding. Nature was not obeying, you know. I guess he thought it would be like the wind and the waves. So, so they're, they're, eventually I'll bet those bees left. Probably because somebody came in there with some pesticide and shot them down. <laughs> you know, so there's a lot of ways that problems can be solved. So we don't want to be foolish or unwise, but I'm trying to at least help you understand a principle that sometimes I don't talk about that much, and, but I think it can help, it can help people. So I think of many times where, where the Lord has helped me take a position of authority, and so the question is, tactically, should you be saying it or should you be praying it? So uh, a lot of that wasn't in my notes. I just kind of ad-libbed it a bit. Hopefully you learned something. Um, Let's stand together. I want to encourage you tonight. uh, We're going to have that time of ministry. I want you to just think in terms of coming and absorbing and soaking and receiving. Come with a ready spirit to worship. And just let's come together and we'll have communion. And the Yonkers will be in their their best tuxes or whatever they're doing. And um, they'll have, you know, their string section going and the ethereal realm will be very near to the ground and we can rise into that ethereal realm with the cello and... All right, anyway, never mind. All right, so let's press into the Lord tonight. We don't have these this often. So when we do, make an effort to come and let's just receive from the Lord. So Lord, we just come to you tonight, just tonight, this morning... And Lord, I, I, just, I just want to come against hopelessness, depression, discouragement that may plague individuals that may be here right now. And we want to take authority over that in the name of Jesus and speak release and speak peace. Lord, if anybody here is laboring under fear this, this morning, where fear has begun to get a grip begins to warp our perspective. Lord, may we be people of faith and we, we subject that fear under our feet in the name of Jesus. I just speak right now, release from all fear. All fear, release God's people this morning. We're not given a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. 
Lord, we receive that spirit of faith, soundness of mind. and love. Thank you, Lord, for speaking with us this morning. We commit this time to you in the name of Jesus. Amen.